holding up well in the current climate. So this talk is going to be about two different models of black hole evaporation. And I'm sure that many of you have probably already seen talks about modeling black hole evaporation in the past few months. So hopefully I'll teach you something new in this one. If not, uh, feel free to tune out. So, um, yeah, so the basic outline of this, I'm going to begin with some introduction and some motivation. And then I'll talk about a semi-classical model of ADS black hole evaporation. So specifically, we'll be talking about evaporating ADS black holes. This is based on a paper that came out with uh, Ahmed, Don, and Henry in May. And again, this is a paper that has been discussed in a lot of conferences. So I'm going to not go into too many of the nitty gritty details on this one, but point out some of the salient features. And then I'll talk about what I'm calling a somewhat classical model of ADS black hole evaporation, which is work with Chris Akers and Daniel Harlow. And this, I say somewhat classical because it's classical in the sense of not involving quantum extremal surfaces, but it's non-classical in the sense that it involves dynamical topology change. So without further ado, uh, let me begin. So I think given what uh, I've quickly scrolled through the names in the audience, given what I've seen, I think uh, I think what I was, I was expecting, I think most of us will probably agree that quantum gravity is a unitary theory. But getting together in a community and saying we all agree on this is not quite tantamount to understanding how that is or deriving that this fact is in fact correct. So resolving the black hole information paradox boils down to more than just all of us sitting down to agree that quantum gravity should be unitary. But it really requires an understanding of the detailed dynamics by which information gets out in the radiation, the fine-grained uh, understanding of the state and understanding of the dynamics that, uh, that bring that about. And here I've drawn a picture of a, um, an asymptotically flat black hole, which is evaporating. So it's just a caricature over here. Um, we have uh, two entangled particles across the horizon, and we have this late time slice sigma prime and an earlier time slice before the black hole is totally evaporated uh, sigma. And of course, the black hole information paradox is, uh, is a, really a question about uh, what happens when you form a black hole from a unitary, from, sorry, from a pure state. At, so down here, the state is pure. And then you ask uh, what happens in the end once the black hole is completely evaporated? Is the radiation pure? If I were to sit outside at late times and measure the radiation, would I find a pure state? Now the von Neumann entropy of the radiation, so minus trace rho log rho, Traditionally, a search is a diagnostic for information loss or conservation. So to measure this entropy at the beginning and at the end, do we find that this is a unitary uh, process? So the canonical way to model this or to think about this is in terms of the page curve. So here we have the page curve. So uh, or we have two curves, sorry, not the page curve so far, just two curves that of two different entropies of the system of interest. So here we have the entropy and here we have, this as a function of time. Now the yellow curve here, this is meant to illustrate the entropy of the radiation. Sorry, can you see when I move my cursor over the screen? Yes. Yes, you can. Yes. Okay. Uh, so this yellow curve, the yellow dotted line is meant to be the entropy of the radiation. Of course, before the black hole has started uh, radiating, the entropy of the radiation is going to be zero. And eventually, if we expect that the black hole completely evaporates, then uh, if you do, the Hawking's calculation would suggest that the state becomes thermal. So you have a mixed state up here. The entropy of the black hole, SBH here, this is what we normally think of as area of the black hole over 4G, 4G h bar. So it starts out at some value. And then because the black hole is evaporating, we have a violation of the null energy condition. So the entropy, the area of the black hole can decrease with time and we get that the entropy decreases until the black hole disappears altogether. So these are the two entropies of interest and the page curve is this curve over here, which is what we expect from a unitary theory. So we expect that in a unitary theory, if the, the Hawking radiation, if, if, if the state initially starts out as pure, eventually we look at the full system, the state is going to be pure again. And so what we expect here is that the entropy of the radiation will initially increase as the black hole starts emitting radiation, but eventually the late radiation will be purified by, uh, by, the, by the system that we already have 
simply because if the full state is pure and the evolution is unitary, then the entropy of the two different subsystems is going to be equal. So this is what we expect from a unitary theory of quantum gravity. And if we had a non-unitary theory, then we might expect something that looks more like that for the Hawking radiation. Now, I should say that a computation of the page curve by itself doesn't actually amount to a resolution of the information paradox. The entropy is a, an interesting and a useful, but nevertheless coarse grained measure of what's actually happening. A complete resolution of the black hole information paradox would require a fine grained understanding of the state of the radiation, the dynamics of the system. So the page curve by itself is not the, uh, not the end all and is not the solution to everything. Nonetheless, a direct calculation of the page curve is a really large step forward. And it, te it tells us a lot. But until recently, it was not considered feasible uh, by the broad community because it was, well, partly because of an expectation that this kind of calculation would involve extensive knowledge of non-perturbative physics. So even though the page curve is a coarse-grained measure, even such a coarse-grained measure of what's going on did not seem to be possible for us to calculate directly, uh, simply because, at least as far as, I, uh, as far as I'm concerned, it would have required extensive knowledge of non-perturbative quantum gravity. So what are the new developments? In my opinion, the, uh, the most exciting part of the new developments and what's been the most interesting, uh, I say new developments, I mean, starting in May and still ongoing work in progress, is that this, this appears to not be the case. We can calculate the page curve for unitary black hole evolution with no direct input from non-perturbative quantum gravity. So just using semi-classical techniques, we can calculate the page curve. And that's something that I think is, is really remarkable. Now, I say no direct input, and there's a reason that I put the qualifier there. And that's because the calculation itself is semi-classical, but it really is the interpretation of it and the calculation itself really are both heavily motivated by holography, which is, uh, of course, one can think of it as a non-perturbative formulation of quantum gravity. So in some sense, if we had gone up earlier and said uh, such a calculation would require extensive knowledge of non-perturbative physics, we could have said, well, what do we know about non-perturbative quantum gravity? Well, we, we know holography for one. We know some things about the Euclidean path and overall that it seems to know. So there are a couple of things we do know. And it turns out that those actually are enough for us to use just semi-classical tools to calculate the page curve. So today I'm going to discuss both the original setup in the papers from May. So this is work by Pennington and work by myself, Ahmed, uh, Henry and Don, in which you can do a semi-classical analysis of an evaporating black hole and you get a unitary page curve. And I'll also discuss a newer model of a black hole evaporation process that exchanges the semi-classical semi -classical analysis for purely classical analysis at the cost of dynamical topology change. There is uh, another classical model, which is the AMMZ, and I'll also comment on that, even though I'm not a member of that collaboration. I, and here is that, that model. Is, uh, so both of these models feature something called the quantum extremal island, which I'll discuss in more detail. And I don't really know what to call it in the, in the classical case, the classical extremal island, but it's a phenomenon that's actually quite familiar to us and that we've seen before. So let, but let me now begin with this uh, semi-classical model of uh, ADS black hole evaporation. Now, at the beginning, you hear some words like an evaporating ADS black hole that might sound funny because small ADS black holes do evaporate, but we don't understand them very well. And large ADS black holes don't evaporate. So the qualitative idea is that we do evaporate a large ADS black hole by coupling it to an external bath. So here is the system, a system before evaporation. So we have a two-sided black hole. So this, this is what it looks like before evaporation is just a static black hole. And this, you have this bifurcation surface, which is the same for the left and right boundaries. And the idea is that we then are going to couple this right boundary to a, an external reservoir. So the, the rough method is that we have this uh, bulk system over here, and prior to some time, we have reflecting boundary conditions. After some time, we couple it to a bath. This will result, oh, sorry, this will result in a shock wave going into the bulk, and it will also result in transparent boundary conditions when there's free exchange between the bath and the bulk. And here we take the bath to be in the ground state, so zero temperature bath. So this is the rough idea. 
And we want to work in a setting where we can really do the calculations directly and precisely. So to do that, we're going to work in JT gravity in ADS2. You can do a, uh, a, more, a less direct calculation or derivation of similar results in higher dimensions with spherical symmetry, and that's what was done by Jeff. So I don't want to spend too much time on the details, but let me just say a few words about uh, JT gravity coupled to a CFT. So this has been studied in a number of different papers, and I've just written down here the action. There's a topological term, which I haven't bothered to write out. And then we have the gravitational dynamics in this term over here, and we also are going to couple this to conformal matter. Now the metric of this theory is, is rather boring. It's just ADS2. So uh, we can write it in these coordinates here, just one choice of coordinates. And um, for those of you who have read the paper that, uh, that we wrote in May, you'll know that we used many different coordinate systems for ADS2 in order to do the calculations. I'm not going to go into all of the different coordinate transformations and the different useful coordinates. I've just written this here as a way of, as a reminder of uh, what ADS2 looks like. So the dynamics here of this, uh, of this theory are given by the boundary, boundary particle. So the boundary time, this is called, called the physical time u, and this you can write as a function of this Poincaré time uh, t. So how are we going to actually evaporate the black hole? Well, we'll take the bulk CFT to being the Poincaré vacuum, and to evaporate the black hole, we're going to consider an auxiliary CFT in flat space. So this is our auxiliary CFT, and we're going to here the, the time coordinate u, we're going to match onto the physical time u here, and we couple these two systems. Now this here is in its ground state. And by coupling these two systems, we essentially force the black hole to evaporate. Now the coupling itself is like a quantum quench, or it is a quantum quench, so it results in a shock wave propagating into the bulk. So now we're going to be, we're ready to compute entanglement entropies. Of course, we could just say, well, let's just calculate the entropy of the bath. And, uh, and see what happens. That's an entropy that seems like it's in the analog of the entropy of the radiation. And we would be doing essentially the Hawking calculation and we would be getting information loss. Or we can use the quantum gravity ingredient that we have on hand, which is the holographic uh, prescription. So we're going to now make use of how we calculate entanglement entropy holographically. So let me just remind you of uh, the basic idea behind holographic entanglement entropy. So to first order in GH bar, in, in the bulk of course, we have the HRT slash FLM proposal. So actually let me begin to be with zeroth order. So it's at zeroth order, if we want to compute the uh, von Neumann entropy of a region R on the boundary, so this is the state rho sub R, the reduced density matrix of a region R on the boundary, if we want to compute this von Neumann entropy, we consider just the first term in this equation, the area of a surface X sub R over four in Planck units. So here XR is the minimal area surface that extremizes the area, or we call it an extremal surface. In JT gravity, of course, surfaces are points. So we don't extremize, we can't extremize the area of a point, instead we extremize the diliton. Now, this term over here comes in at next order in GH bar, so the first order in GH bar, we pick up a quantum correction in the value of the von Neumann entropy of the bulk quantum fields across XR. So XR here is, uh, you have the surface XR and you have the region, the boundary region R. So XR here is homologous to the boundary region R. And rho bulk here is the state of the quantum fields in that region. There's gonna be a picture on the next slide. I should say, as long as the boundary system is evolving unitarily, there's not going to be a T dependence here, unless you're considering actually modifying your region R. Now, if we want to work it to higher orders in GH bar, we're going to have to make a modification. So let me actually go back here for a second. The, the reason is, uh, in some sense, historical, the, the motivation behind this mod modification, which is that historically, when you want to consider the back reaction of quantum fields on your geometry, you end up, uh, you, you violate the null energy condition and a lot of statements that are generally true about areas, like the area increase theorem, Hawking's area increase theorem, end up being false. And the appropriate thing to do is to replace them with statements about a quantum corrected area or the generalized entropy. And so Aaron and I proposed that 
you can calculate holographic entanglement entropy to all orders in GH bar if you instead uh, place the, this quantity, if you, instead of extremizing the area for this, that, that surface here, so this here is a surface that extremizes the area, instead of doing that, you consider the surface, which we call chi r, that extremizes this joint quantity, this quantum corrected area, also known as the generalized entropy. So here is a picture. So we have, uh, this is a boundary at a given moment in time. This is a region R. And here is a surface chi R. And we consider the surface chi R that extremizes the area, its area plus the von Neumann entropy on this outside, which is this, the region in between chi R and R. So this is a higher dimensional system where chi R is extended in space. Of course, in JT gravity, chi R is just a point, but it doesn't really change the, uh, this qualitatively, except instead of area, we consider the dilaton. Now, just as a sanity check, using the generalized second law, you can prove that this prescription satisfies causal wedge inclusion, which is to say the quantum extremal surface. That's what we call the surface that extremizes S gen. The quantum extremal surface satisfies, uh, always lies, um, always contains the causal wedge. Uh, as I said, as a, as a side comment, this formulation alone, this extremal surface, quantum extremal surface formulation, isn't quite enough to prove a number of other uh, conditions, but those you can prove using other techniques. Now, this is another side which will turn out to be quite important. There is a qualitative difference between classical and quantum extremal surfaces, which is that the, the, we don't no longer have complementary recovery. So classically, a surface which is extremal, it just means that under small variations of the area, uh, small variations of location of the surface, the area is stationary. And it doesn't matter if you are evaluating that on the side of R or on the side of R bar. But for the case where we consider quantum corrections, this does not need to be the case any longer. If we have a mixed state in the bulk, then it is possible that the surface that extremizes the generalized entropy evaluated on this side does not actually extremize the generalized entropy evaluated on the other side. This is because in a mixed state, the entropy of the two sides does not have to be equal. And so we can end up with a situation where there is a gap between the quantum extremal surface for R and the quantum extremal surface for R bar. And this will turn out to be rather important. So now that we've uh, reminded ourselves of how to calculate entanglement entropy holographically, let's, uh, let's go back to our evaporating black hole example. So before we eva start evaporating the black hole, before we couple the two systems, the left and right quantum extremal surfaces are literally just a bifurcation surface. This surface is also a classical extremal surface. So everything agrees, the left quantum extremal surface, the right quantum extremal surface, and the classical extremal surface. As we start evaporating the black hole, remember this is, we are evaporating the, the right side. Initially, this quantum extremal surface begins to move continuously in a space-like direction towards R. Eventually, we get something that's a little more dramatic than that. So let me parse this picture here. So this is, uh, the red here is meant to be what happens initially. So this it begins over here. This is the left quantum extremal surface, by the way, which does not move since we're only modifying the right side. So initially the surface moves a little bit in a space-like direction as we evaporate the black hole. This here is meant to represent the shock as a, that results from coupling the two systems together. And the dotted line over here is a, quantum ex, a new quantum extremal surface that nucleates at late times. And this one doesn't have a classical counterpart in the sense that there is no nearby classical extremal surface in this space time. At some point, this new quantum extremal surface actually begins to dominate, which is to say it has less generalized entropy than the ones that are down there or than any other quantum extremal surface in the space time. And so we end up with a situation over here where the right quantum extremal surface is up here, where the left quantum extremal surface is over there. And, the, and, there's, and this is a result of this jump between the two quantum extremal surfaces. And the effect of this transition is, the, is really it is the unitary page curve in the bulk. The fact that there is a jump in this surface is, uh, is, is, is part of the derivation of the unitary page curve. Now there's a, this, this in some sense is a very, very suggestive picture, at least it was at the time, since then it's been uh, understood better, that uh, if we consider, we, we look at the entang this entanglement wedge here, 
This is the entanglement wedge of the right CFT. And this here is the entanglement wedge of the left CFT. And then there's this gap region in between them. And so if we want to take the entanglement wedge reconstruction very seriously, then one might suggest, and this indeed was what was suggested, that the region between these two, the so-called quantum extremal island, is the entanglement wedge of the system that we threw out, the radiation. And so this, uh, this, this is really a consequence of this non-complementary recovery that I discussed earlier. So as I say here, the existence of this quantum extremal island appears to be synonymous with the failure of complementary recovery due to the fact that we're extremizing over a mixed state. So a few words about semi-classical unitary evaporation it might seem like an oxymoron. So we do a series of semi-classical operations and computations that have no non-perturbative physics in them. Everything is strictly in the semi-classical regime. Of course, beyond the interpretation of quantum extremal surfaces as computing an entropy. And this allowed us to calculate a unitary page curve, which personally I find pretty remarkable. Now, this we shouldn't, we can celebrate, but we shouldn't totally celebrate just yet. Um, because we still don't have a complete understanding of what's going on. And here's one example of something that we don't yet quite understand. In principle, just looking at our low energy effective theory, the semi-classical approximation we're working with, it could in principle be UV completed by a unitary quantum theory of gravity or a non-unitary quantum theory of gravity. And the quantum extremal surface prescription clearly only computes correctly the entropy in the unitary theory. Now, if the quantum extremal surface prescription just spits out a unitary answer, no matter whether the UV completion is unitary or not, then it's not a very good prescription. In other words, if we were hoping to use this as a test of whether our quantum gravity theory is unitary, and this prescription is just uh, an automaton that always just tells you, gives you a unitary answer no matter what, then, well, it's, it didn't actually teach us very much. So if we imagine that we could have a holographic non-unitary theory, we should be able to ask if quantum extremal surface would give us the correct answer in that case. Would it give us a non-unitary answer in that case? And if it does, then that means that the fact that we got a unitary answer here, it really is a contentful statement. But it's very difficult to see in this model how, that, how, how we should test such a thing. Of course, we, I don't think many of us really believe in uh, information loss anyway, so we don't, maybe we don't think that this is something that we want to engineer. But it would be nice if we had a simpler model where we were actually hey, able to understand this. Um, can I ask a question? Yes. Hi. Um, yeah, so about the comment about the unitarity, I, I don't quite understand. So if I, um, if I have a low energy theory, uh, which is unitary, but then I, let's say I have one, one uh, flavor of the field coupled to another flavor. So if you only look at one of the flavor, it's not unitary anymore. I treat mm -hmm. the other one as thermal bath. Then I would expect the, the QES will not be um, contradictory with this, right? Um, so what I'm what I'm saying here is, in principle, we don't have a an understanding of the UV uh, completion, the full UV completion of the theory here. And while I think I think we we probably all agree that the UV completion, that it's a holographic theory, is going to be unitary in the event that it is not. Um, we would like the quantum extremal surface prescription to nonetheless give us the correct answer. And I, I'm not sure if this answers your question. It does? Okay. Okay, I guess, uh, I guess what I, what the case I was talking about is like uh, you're doing a partition but not in real space. So that's probably the reason why it's, it's not directly captured by the QES. Yeah, yeah I, will, I will give an example of uh, the simpler model that I'm about to discuss, which can, uh, where you can sort of ad hoc model a holographic theory with non-unitary evolution and see that quantum extremal surfaces actually do give you the right answer. So the fact that we get a unitary answer in the case that we do is really is a contentful statement. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, it's worth, maybe it's worth also commenting that you could just choose to view this Jakeev Teitelboim coupled to the matter CFT as a UV complete theory by itself. And then you can just compute the entropy of the bath in the bulk and, it, and it's mixed. It doesn't uh, have a page curve that goes down and that's fine. That's the answer if you view it as its own UV completion. So somehow the quantum extremal surface prescription is for when you think it has some more interesting UV completion that's holographic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but this is, it's hard to see how um, 
how we would use quantum extremal surfaces in a, to, give, to get a non-unitary answer in a non-unitary theory, uh, given this semi-classical model that we're working with. So a simpler model would be quite nice. And so what could be simpler than a classical picture? Well, the semi-classical picture, well, certainly a classical picture would be simpler than a semi-classical picture. Now there's an- so what do you, um, yeah, yeah, Sorry, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was having trouble unmuting myself. Um, so what do you mean by a UV completion in, in two dimensions? Gravity is renormalizable. Um, it's a conformal field theory. So there isn't a UV. Uh, that's a good point. So I, I, I would, I, I like to think of JT as a trunk, as a low, uh, sorry, as a, as a dimensional reduction of some uh, higher dimensional theory with some quantum gravity completion. If that answers your question. But you don't have to. I mean, that's what I was saying. You don't have you to. Can, you right. can choose to view it complete theory like the CGHS model and then it just has information loss that's the right answer and you just shouldn't uh, take the quantum extremal surface seriously. Well I think Andy was asking about a unitary UV completion. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I think well I think I mean it's Louisville theory or something well depends what you mean by unitary you mean with a boundary or something and there's uh, also the question of the boundary on the dilaton. Is that what you're no, I mean, I mean, I mean, I, I don't mean the a holographic. I don't mean that we we have some. Okay, we could talk about the holographic dual, but I mean that the theory itself. If you just do, if you if you had access to the full um, equations of motion in quantum gravity, and you did a, a, an evolution of the late early time slice to a late time slice, then you would find that the um, the entropy that is uh, the, the evolution of the state is unitary. Um, okay, so if that answers the questions, uh, let me move on. So a classical picture would be certainly simpler than a semi-classical picture. Uh, so there is only an example of a classical picture, which is this uh, AMMZ uh, model, which gave a 3D holographic interpretation of this system. So there was a, an, a the um, two-dimensional CFT in the bulk was considered to be, was taken to be a holographic CFT, and then an additional third holographic dimension was added in. So sort of holography within holography. Uh, we're going to look at a different model where we can prescribe the dynamics. So we can literally put in by hand that it's uh, unitary or it's not unitary, and we can force it to be holographic and see what it does. So this is based on a paper that was uh, written with uh, Chris Akers and Daniel Harlow this past fall. Okay, so again, it's somewhat classical model because we're going to have to use uh, topology change. So we're going to work with a toy model. So the black hole here evaporates by emission of smaller black holes. So these are our stand-ins for the Hawking quanta. And this is not, it's not as crazy as it sounds. So the, uh, the emission of the black hole, so we have a large black hole, we have emission of small black holes. So this is going to result in a wormhole with a new exit. And I'll have a picture of the time slices in a moment, but I just want to make the point that we can get time symmetric geometries like this in 3D by doing different quotients of, uh, of ADS3. So we can cut a, um, a Riemann surface in different ways to get multi-boundary wormholes. So we know how to prepare uh, wormholes like this. So here is a picture, a happy picture. So we consider uh, discrete time steps. So each step brings a new topology change. So let me parse this picture here. We start out with some uh, CFT, holographic CFT dual to a black hole. And here, this is already part way through the evaporation, just to be, uh, just to throw things a little bit simpler. And so each one of these, uh, of these, this, these pants here, each one of these exits is the, constitutes the Hawking radiation. And we're going to take the Hawking radiation to be holographic here. So they have these two dimensional CFTs and they are holographic. And we model this using these connected wormhole geometries. So at every time step, we have this discrete time evolution and at the next time step, we get an additional leg to the, uh, to the wormhole, additional pair, the, the pair of pants grows. You get a monster that needs to constantly change its tailor. Um, so here we have the, eventually we get many, many of these, uh, of these wormhole exits. Now we're also going to, just for simplicity, take that any one of these fixed time steps, the geometry is time symmetric. And then we look at the extremal surfaces in this geometry so we can calculate the entropy. Here, there are no bulk quantum fields, so we don't have to worry about calculating bulk entropies. This is a very simple analysis. We can just look at the extremal surfaces, the classical extremal surfaces, which in the absence of bulk quantum fields, of course, will coincide with the uh, quantum extremal surfaces. 
So we have uh, two different sets of extremal surfaces that are homologous to the Hawking radiation. There is gamma prime here, which is the bifurcate horizon of the uh, black hole, the large black hole, the one that's evaporating. And then we have the, this gamma, which is the union of these, and these surfaces here are the bifurcate horizons of the little Hawking radiation uh, wormholes. So initially, when we start out, the black hole is quite large and these are quite small. So the dominating extremal surface is going to be the union of these, all of these gamma. So I'm going to just call it one disconnected surface, this, this over here. And so the entanglement wedge of the Hawking radiation is quite small, it's just this. And the entanglement wedge of the large black hole is this entire region over here. It's quite large, it's most of the bulk. Now at late times, eventually what's going to happen is that gamma prime is going to shrink and then gamma will grow. And eventually there's going to be a switch over. So in this, the switch over, gamma prime will become smaller than gamma. And that is when the entanglement wedge of the Hawking radiation all of a sudden becomes very large and the entanglement wedge of the black hole becomes very small. Now I should mention, which is, this, is, this is of course a caricature and it's somewhat ad hoc, uh, but we can think of this as a classical version of the quantum octopus. So this is really heavily motivated by ER equals EPR. And, um, and again, it, it's, it's, it's meant to just be a model of a, a classical model of what could really be going on on a quantum level. Okay, so uh, I, I already went through this, but uh, just to emphasize, the, there is a jump where the Hawking radiation initially contains, the, the, its entanglement wedge contains very little uh, of the bulk, and eventually later it contains almost the entire bulk when there's a jump to this gamma prime over here. That's the dynamics of this model, which involves the dynamical topology change. And as a consequence of this, of course, we get a page curve. So initially, we have this, uh, this increase over here, and that corresponds to the fact that we, have, we are evaporating, we're getting progressively more of these legs, so the area of, um, of gamma grows. And eventually, however, we get the switch over, and of course, gamma prime continues to shrink as we evaporate more and more of the black holes. So we get this, which uh, looks very nice, of course. This looks just like the unitary page curve uh, in this toy model. Now, I would like to mention that this, uh, this model actually does involve a, uh, a, an island, a quantum extremal island. So that's just the region between gamma prime and gamma. So we get this jump and uh, just as before, the, now we have the entanglement wedge of the Hawking radiation containing this entire interior and the black hole entanglement wedge, the entanglement wedge of the CFT that was evaporating contains very little of it, which of course is uh, very reminiscent, uh, just one second, of the um, of the Allen uh, phenomenon, yeah. I'm sorry, I have a question about the page curve. So uh, is there a, a, a physical reason that uh, it's evaporating faster and faster? It was the, the horizontal axis is n, is the number of... Uh, uh, so so you're, you're asking about the slope here or the slope here? The slope in the second part, yeah. The slope the, in the second part. In, in, the, in the case of structural black hole, we know it's evaporating faster, it's like a negative specific heat. So, uh, so you're the asking thing is evaporating faster, but why? here, what is there a meaning? Yeah. Sorry, I'm just not sure I understand the question. Well, why is there a, a negative second derivative? Over here? Uh, yeah, this part after page time. Um, well, let me remind myself if I remember the formula for this. Um, I mean, I know that the horizontal axis is not really time, but if I think of that as time, that's indicating the temperature is going up. Well, so so. Why? I mean, we, we're okay. So it's just energy conservation. There's a square root of a square of a sum of squares or something in the formula for the energy. Oh, I see. That's, that's right. That's right. Thank you. Okay. Oh, okay. So, um, so, so a nice aspect of this model that's really very simplifying is that the this island phenomenon uh, looks like just standard quantum error correction. So if you pick too few of the radiation CFTs, even at a time, so if, even after the page time, then the entanglement wedge is not going to contain this island region over here. Whereas if you pick, uh, too few, if you pick enough of the radiation CFTs, or if you say take the union with a black hole, then you end up recovering the, uh, the island region, this region in between gamma prime and gamma. 
So it seems that this is a very simple mechanism by which we reconstruct the island, just simply using quantum error correction. Now, I don't know how I'm doing on time. I have, uh, do I have a few minutes left? Yes. Okay, great. So maybe, I want to say a few words about information loss, um, partly because it looks like my audience is not quite riled up enough. And I want to see what, uh, what the reactions are. I should advocate, I, I, should, I should begin by uh, a disclaimer. I don't actually think that information is lost. So um, everything I say now is for academic purposes in order to understand better uh, what it is about this quantum extremal surfaces that's computing the, when, it, when they compute unitary evolution, are they computing it, or when they compute a unitary page curve, are they computing this curve because they always compute a unitary curve no matter what, or because this actually is a contentful prescription that would give us the right answer if we had information loss. So what would a holographic calculation of information loss, a holographic calculation, a holographic Hawking calculation look like? So here's one possibility. So we have this, uh, this black hole. And again, it, and the Hawking radiation, instead of being connected to the black hole by a wormhole, is connected to a baby universe. So we, instead of the previous example where we had the radiation CFTs connected to the black hole, instead they are connected to a baby universe. And as we evolve forwards in time, again, with these discrete time steps, we get instead um, multiple of these wormholes connecting the Hawking radiation to a baby universe. So this is a, this is a holographic uh, prescription that would be consistent with information loss. And we, if we look at the, what the extremal surfaces are doing here, and say we want to calculate the entropy of the Hawking radiation, then uh, well, we begin with this uh, surface, one surface gamma, and then we get two of these gammas, and we just get more and more of them, and so the entropy just keeps on increasing. Now you might ask, what happened, whatever happened to gamma prime? Well, gamma prime is completely irrelevant for the Hawking radiation. It doesn't actually calculate anything for it because this surface is not homologous to this boundary. So gamma prime doesn't do anything, and whether gamma prime increases in size or decreases in size or disappears or whatever happens there is completely irrelevant because it's gamma that calculates the entropy of the Hawking radiation. Now, of course, again, to reiterate, uh, we really think that information is not lost in a relativistic quantum gravity theory. But it is nice to know, first of all, that the quantum extremal surface prescription or just the holographic entanglement entropy prescription uh, does give us a contentful answer in the sense that it, if there is information loss, it will tell you that there is information loss. So this does raise the question of how we would describe the Hawking answer of black hole evaporation in the semi-classical gravity model by quantum extremal surfaces. Is there some version of Hawking's calculation that we could do in, um, in the JT gravity model? So I'm going to leave a comment on that maybe to the end, but uh, I want to just do a final comparison of these two pictures. And you'll note that the happy face is on the uh, information conservation and not in information loss. It should tell you where we stand in case I wasn't abundantly clear about that. Um, so one interesting thing here is that um, we might have said in the top picture that the wrong Hawking calculation corresponds to always using the surface gamma and just not making the switch over to gamma prime when you need to. And even past the point where gamma is no longer dominant. And in the bottom picture, we would have said that the wrong calculation, which is the unitary one, would switch between gamma and gamma prime when the latter has smaller area, even though gamma prime is not homologous to the Hawking radiation. So in either case here, there is a wrong calculation that one could do with the quantum extremal surfaces that would give you the answer that you might or might not be looking for. It could give you information loss in, the, um, in a unitary model, or it would give you information conservation in the model of information loss. Um, you, so using the wrong saddle gives the wrong answer, but the wrong answer for a given theory can actually be information conservation. Not that we subscribe to that. Okay, so let me, uh, I think I have basically no time left, so let me summarize. So understanding the information paradox, I think is, uh, everyone can agree is of paramount importance for understanding space-time and space-time emergence in quantum gravity. And holography gives us this tractable way of modeling black hole evaporation, surprisingly, with semi-classical tools. 
So the question of quantum gravity dynamics and defined weight structure of the state is a really important one and not one that we've addressed so far. Calculating the entropy is not quite enough to tell us about the quantum gravity dynamics and the fine grained structure of the state. And I think as we've, as we've seen now with these two different models, the, the, the dynamics really is quite important. Now we've also not understood the role of Hawking radiation, of the Hawking calculation in all of this. And I, I will say that uh, possibly in a little bit of a whiny way that people have been telling me for the past few months that Hawking forgot to include a saddle when he did the replica trick. And this was said with such um, a plumb and confidence that I went back and checked twice whether Hawking actually used the replica trick because I was starting to question my sanity. And of course, Hawking didn't use the replica trick. And saying that he forgot to include a saddle doesn't actually tell us exactly what he did wrong or what he was he was calculating uh, in terms of our models and this JT gravity model or um, these three dimensional models. And I think this is something that's, uh, that's quite important for us to understand. And I should say it's also a work in progress uh, with Daniel and Chris. So with that, since I'm quite over, um, I will thank you for your attention. Okay, thanks Netta. We're all giving you applause here. Um, yeah, you, 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 you've done well to try to provoke some questions by some of the statements in your talk. So surely there are some questions in the audience. And if you could turn on your video, if you ask a question, that'd be great. Can I ask a question about the information loss? Yeah. Uh, can you go back a uh, few slides to show the picture? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Here for the, uh, for the baby universe case, mm -hmm. why didn't gamma vanish? Uh, why does gamma vanish? Why, why didn't it vanish? The baby universe doesn't have any boundary, right? So if you calculate Hawking ha radiation, then uh, yeah, the so, minimal so side will vanish. Um, so here, so I, maybe I shouldn't call it a baby universe. Um, here we, we are taking this, so th there's a, we're taking these to be holographic CFTs. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. So it can Maybe baby boundaries. universe is a slightly, mis slightly misleading terminology. Well, it, it's, it's analogous to the baby universe in yeah, our calculation. Yes. But in this case, it represents some other asymptotic region, right? That's right. Yes. So, yeah, the I the idea is that in the semi-classical picture, the degrees of freedom in the baby universe are independent in Hawking's mm -hmm. calculation. So we're trying to model that in holography. Well, but in holography, the, what you call baby universes would be a real asymptotic region. And it's really different than- This is why it's, you're saying, yeah. because you're, you're saying how you think baby universes actually work, right? But here we're trying to, make a holographic cartoon of how they work in Hawking's calculation. But, okay. So, okay. okay. so you're, you're, I mean, at the entangled CFT, I think that would resolve the, uh, the problem. We, this, we don't mean that this is actually literally a baby universe the way we normally use Right, it. right, right. I mean, th this would be the calculation if somehow the black hole interior were to evolve to either one or many multiple universes. This is yes, that's, that's right. right. But the equations have been forgotten, and that's why we get yes. the entropy. Which I think is what Hawking's calculation does. It's not what we, we don't think it's right, as Neva said. Right, right. Well, that, that's, that's implicitly the idea that relativists would have. Or, or yes, yeah, yes. that's right. Yeah. That's say, right. Say, that's in, the black hole interior is the second asymptotic region. And so you should. Mm -hmm. I had another comment about whether the GHS model or JT gravity have information loss. Um, I think in order to discuss whether they have loss or not, we need to make um, S0 finite, right? So we need to make uh, the, pos we need to allow the possibility of topology changes. Yes. So You'll need an app for me to help you with that. Um, you can try searching the app store. Sorry, was there, was there a question? No, it was just a comment that uh, I think uh, if you just take CGHS and you don't allow topology change, you cannot, I think, ask the question of um, whether you do or do not have information loss because the entropy is infinite and if you don't allow. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. That's true. Now, if you allow topology change, then I think what happens uh, with those models is that they are 
uh, um, they, they just uh, are, are ill-defined because when you calculate heterogeneous corrections, the, you will get infinities from the clustering tachyons. So when you interpret them as world sheets, you you have regions where the next becomes small, and uh, you would have some topology. Well, you have some infinities. So yes, that's true. I, I disagree with that. I think you can just do canonical quantization and construct a mathematical theory where you, in Lorenzian signature where you um, where the s not you know in JT where phi naught is finite, but but you just don't have other topologies. I don't think there's anything mathematically wrong with it. Uh, I mean, you can say it gives information loss, which you don't like. Well, I, I, sh I just define s not to be the cost of change in the topology. So I think what you're well, doing. I, is I define it to be a term in the action. Uh, okay, but the term in the action that weights different topologies. So, I, I, yeah, I, but in but in Lorenzian signature, there there aren't other topologies. So, I mean, the, it, I mean, this seems to me like a question about the contour of the path integral of Euclidean gravity, or, or let's just say of quantum gravity, and we don't know what the contour is. All I can say is there is a choice of contour where there's information loss. I guess I just comment that Polchinski and I did write a paper in which we included um, topology change in CJHS. And uh, of course, it's a little hard to control the calculation, but uh, also we included the fact of the, um, you know, the alpha parameters and so on. Um, and it looked, uh, it, it seemed to be pointing more towards the theory of, of remnants, which, is less problematic in 2D than in 4D, but still you, you don't have the entropy following the, the page curve. So it, I don't know, it didn't seem to be that nice. But maybe you want to include topology change in a different way than what we did. Well, uh, all, all I'm saying is you, you, you introduce the qualitative effects of topology change somehow assuming that there would be no UV issues. I'm just only pointing out that these particular theories have UV issues. Now, whether they're, maybe they're relevant, but uh, that's what I was saying. Uh, it's, tr so. it's true there are UV issues on higher topologies. Yes. Uh, Netta, we also have a, we have a raised hand. Oh, okay. From uh, Animi Ghosh. Are you there, Gosh? Okay, I don't hear him chiming up, so. Can I just ask a question about what was on the last slide? Uh, the very last slide? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, good, so the, the, this thing about the role of the Hawking calculation, Yes. So here, do you mean in the context where if you were to not use the replica trick, how to understand all of this? Is that what you're... That's right. Okay. I, 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 he did a calculation that is not mm -hmm. parallel in any way to the calculations that have been done. And I don't, I think that just doing the calculation correctly, it just, I don't want to say just, doing the calculation correctly, which is extremely important, is not, at least I don't find it a, sufficient to explain why his calculation was not correct. Right. I mean, presumably if he had done the replicas trick, I would have guessed that he would not have forgotten to include the saddle. But I think what's meant by that remark is if you do the replicas trick and don't include the saddle, then you get exactly the answer you get by his method, which doesn't use the replica trick. Sure. But that doesn't address the question of if you don't use the replica trick, what went yeah, wrong? Yeah, I, I, I agree. Okay, thanks. Yeah, another way to rephrase or reiterate what, what Netta is saying is if we've understood something new about um, how we should think about semi-classical gravity, we should be able to point a finger at exactly where Hawking made a mistake yes. and not say that if he did it some other way using some other trick, he would have gotten a different answer. Yeah. It, there should be a mistake in his calculation. Right. It's an incredibly hard uh, thing though. Like, well, okay, we talked about this in Santa Barbara, but like replica symmetry breaking is a good analogous example where it's very hard to see what it looks like if you don't use the replica trick. And I, I completely agree it's a super interesting question, but I also think it might be very hard. There isn't a derivation of, of the replica trick in an asymptotically flat space time. There is in 
something like that in AVS. But what if you take the point of view that uh, it's an uh, ensemble average, so you can never calculate an uh, ensemble average density matrix, but you can calculate an ensemble average of entropy, which you only have access to uh, using replica chain. But I mean, does it, do any of us actually believe that it's really an ensemble average? I, mean, I, I was going to say, I think we, we're all hoping that uh, if we do this calculation in n equals four supreme ink mills, we're still going to get a unitary page curve, so. I, I, I think that the Hawking errors is just not applying the, the proper formula, the, let's say, Engel Hallow World formula, Ryuta Kanagi, blah, 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 formula, right? Um, so. But that's not enough, Juan. You, you have to say why he should have applied that formula. <laughs> well, because this is the formula that follows from Gibbons Hawking and the generalization of Gibbons Hawking for fine grain entropy. So, Juan, I don't think this is fair. There's only one correct yeah. formula for entropy, and that formula is minus trace of rho log rho. Okay. So, and, uh, and, and Hawking did use that formula. It's just he probably applied it to the wrong state. Uh, I mean, no, I think no, I think I, I disagree with this. So the uh, there is that formula, but when you are dealing with the theory of gravity, you 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 don't you don't have an, a manifest description of the of, of the states, and um, and in the theory of gravity, if you are getting the state using the theory of gravity, you should apply the you should include in the entropy um, other contributions. I think the justification yeah. for that is that in the dual CFT, you use minus trace of row log let row. Me, if that weren't the let case, let you wouldn't say that. Okay. Okay. That's consistent with what okay. you're let, saying. Let, 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 me, let, let me say it differently. So suppose, suppose that you were computing the entropy of a gas that contains some black hole in the middle. Okay. So if you just compute the entropy of the gas, you would get, you wouldn't get the right answer. And you have to include the area term. And why, why do we include the area term? We, we believe that there are some states mysterious and so on, and, and we should include the area term, but we think the area term is the correct way to do it in the theory of gravity. I think that's consistent with what Dan is saying, that the wrong state there is just using the state of just the gas. That's what you were saying, right? That you're applying the formula to the wrong state. But I think you guys are saying- I mean, you, you want to apply the formula minus trace of row log row in the microscopic theory, right? Yeah. And, then it's, and then it's going to give you the right answer. The, thing, the nice thing here is that there's some other formula you can use when you don't have the microscopic theory that seems to agree with what we think the microscopic theory says, you know. But, but, but in right. the end, right, the real justification is doing it in the microscopic theory. Right. Yeah, I agree. I agree that there is the assumption that when you calculate, what you're doing a calculation in a theory that is well defined, that, that has some states, and that's what we call entropy. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, so, but then in gravity, we calculate entropies by things which are not manifestly summing over states, like uh, the black hole. Well, no, uh, on, that's because we're weak, in the right? asymptotic region on scribe plots, we just, you know, we can neglect gravity and we compute entropy in that way that we always do. Yeah, Andy, no, Andy, Andy, it Andy computed it using minus trace of rho log rho, right? In Andy's famous paper with Kumran, they use minus trace of rho log rho. Well, but that's, that's uh, I agree, but that, that is a formula where those states are not manifest in the gravity, at least the way we understand gravity so far. Maybe in the future we'll understand them. So. Well, look, if we just wanted to say we're going to assume unitarity, I mean, Paige already did that. Paige already um, no, we're not computed the we're page not we, 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 there, there is a calculation that is well defined, and, and you apply the, the formula, and you get some answer with factors of two, and I don't know plus logarithms of something. I don't know, there is a well-defined formula with numbers and everything. Yeah, I think it's more right than Page's calculation, I think. <laughs> I think it's analogous to the black hole entropy formula, right? So to, to, to the black hole entropy yeah. formula of area plus entanglement entropy. So it gives which, you some answer. Which it's many people didn't entropy. believe until it was derived. <laughs> Right, 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 right. So you, you, there, there is, but that could be computed to various orders and so on. And, and yeah, people didn't believe it. It wasn't supposed to be true for extrema black holes. And so, I mean, even Hawking wrote this paper where it wasn't supposed to be true for extrema black holes. And, but anyway, yeah. when you calculated it, okay, well, that's, uh, you know. 
but I guess we don't, we still don't understand the connection between this microscope, the, the picture where we have the explicit Hilbert space and the semi-classical picture. That I guess is. And there's, I guess there's, I, there's also the question of the new thing that we could compute. It, is there, is there a, um, a universal prediction for the corrections to the page curve? Page already computed the page curve from unitarity, but if you've understood something more, you should be able to compute something more. So can you compute the, you know, the correct, the subleading correction, log M corrections to, to, uh, to the page curve for four dimensional Schwarzschild? I think in the paper of the, the West Coast paper, they're able to compute the, the structure of the curve at the top of the turnover, which is something that Page was mm -hmm. not able to compute, at least in some simple models. Yeah, not, not in 4D, in 2D. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but in some example, that's already, yeah, right, we have one of the authors here, yes. <laughs> But that's assuming some microscopics, right? Just using JT gravity rules. There, there yeah. are some, there's some assumptions about the Euclidean path integral. but that's, it, it doesn't that's assume anything about the, the UV completion, but it does assume that you can use the path integral, Euclidean path integral to do the calculation. Well, if we've understood the rule well, and it is a good semi-classical rule, we should be able to compute corrections to the page curve in four-dimensional pure gravity. Yeah, in principle, yes. Yeah, it, it's just, it's hard to cut, to find quantum extremal surfaces explicitly in four dimensions mm -hmm. because you have to calculate the bulk entropy um, for a curved geometry and back reaction in higher dimensions. It's very difficult, it's just computationally speaking. I think to quote Steve Schenker, if it was a matter of national security, we could do it. <laughs> Maybe not this administration, but a different administration. Okay, Daniel. Uh, thanks for that comment. That reminded me of a public service announcement I was supposed to make asking people to please not inject themselves with bleach today. But um, are there any other questions for Netta after this beautiful talk and discussion? Okay, let's uh, thank her again. Thanks, Netta.